Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, as usual, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, and all of the folks involved with Bible Talk, yes. we want to just greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. We're so glad, so glad, that we can gather together in His Word, and because His Word is always life-giving and life-changing. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Makes all the difference. Makes all the difference. Uh, oh, that we could be together physically. Mm. But uh, considering where people watch us around the world, that would be a little tough. Mm. But oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Hallelujah. Thank you. So we're continuing on in our study, getting, coming close to the conclusion here, or maybe even getting to the conclusion, of the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And in our last program, we talked about the shield of faith. Okay, And today we're going to go on and move on to verse 17 in Ephesians 6, about the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. But before we do that, before we start, I'm just going to ask my lovely wife, Alice, if you'll ask God's blessing on our time together today. Yes. Father, we do. We come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we just praise you and thank you for the opportunities that we do have to get together in your word, your precious word that strengthens us and guides us and directs us. And Lord, we pray that as this word goes forth, it would touch hearts and change lives, because we know the power of your word. And don't let anything come out of Alan's mouth that isn't from you. We just praise you and thank you. Amen. Amen. Yes, this word is able to change lives. And that's what I want to talk about as we go on and look at this, Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The helmet of salvation. The Lord God Almighty does not want you to lean on your own understanding. That's exactly what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Lean not on your own understanding. We have to learn to trust in Him. He wants you to get understanding from Him, as well as knowledge and wisdom. All right? It's not. He's not depending on us to generate this ourselves. He's depending on us to be open to receive it from Him. Yes. So, for, for example, I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 2. All right? In the first six verses of Proverbs 2. It says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandment within you. Make your ears attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver, and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord, and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Yes, God loves you. He loves you just the way you are. He loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. God wants to change you. Yes. There is a purpose to this Bible study for us and for you. And that purpose is to change yes. you. You know, a, a number of years ago, we were ministering overseas and I was, we were in England and I was invited to, to speak at a church and that's exactly what I did. I, you know, this church was a <clears throat> Pentecostal church. Yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. But they, they had, like most churches do, a pretty firm program, yes. an established way of doing things every week. Mm -hmm. You know, there was uh, the, the music group would get up and sing three songs or whatever, and somebody else would get up and make the announcements, say, take up the offerings. Then the pastor would get up and introduce, if he wasn't speaking, he'd get up and introduce the speaker, which was me. And, and before anybody had an opportunity to start the services, I walked up to the podium and I looked over at the pastor and I said, it's time for me to speak. And normally they would have sent all of the children out to their children's school, but they didn't even have time to do that. So, I mean... This kind is of, totally leading in the Holy Spirit. Well, I hadn't pl I, I promise you that I hadn't planned it, planned it, and nobody knew about it, including me, yeah. until it happened. That's perfect. So I got up and I said, I said, the first thing is, I said, I would like everybody in this room 
to get up and move and sit someplace that you've never sat before. And I'd like you to sit next to somebody that you never sat next to before. Oh my goodness gracious. How big was the crowd? Well, it wasn't the crowd, it was a congregation, but it was probably about 150 people or so, right? Uh, and yeah, I mean, you could just see the nervousness. It was like, oh my goodness. Hesitancy. Yeah. But I, so my sermon was about the but fact. they did. Yeah, they did. And I said, the reason I'm asking you to do this is because God brought you into this room today for one purpose, and that purpose is to change you. Because he, he promised to bring us from glory to glory. It's his promise to change us. We need changing. Unless you have achieved here and now on this planet perfection in it, well, if you have, do me a favor and write to me. Office at BibleTalk.com. I got to see you. Right? But like most of us, we are, we are still working towards that perfection. Although God's, when we are in Christ Jesus, the Father looks and he sees that perfection of Jesus in us. But that's what he's bringing us to, right? Because if we don't allow that change, we'll become stagnant. Well, yeah, because that, that's what I just said. I mean, it's like in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul wrote, But we all, all, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So this is, this is what God is doing. He's transforming us, all right? He is the potter, and we are the clay. We are the work of his hands, just as it says in Isaiah 64, 8. God the Father, he, he is molding and shaping us, transforming us, changing us. It is part of the most glorious promise. You know, be, before we were saved, the most glorious promise was that salvation was there for whoever would receive it. But now that we're saved, you know what I think the most glorious promise is? It is this, in Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. God is conforming us into the image of Jesus, back into the image of God, which is what he did with Adam until Adam sinned and became deformed. That's right. The change takes place as we, like Lazarus, you know, coming out of the tomb, out of the tomb of death and into new life, are being unbound from the grave clothes. That's what's going on now. The old ways of thinking, the old habits, and the traditions of men. God is changing us from those things. And that's why it was written in Romans 12, too, that we, it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our minds... It's, it's like, that's the, the computer that stores our belief in our hearts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The brain may be the CPU, but the storage place is the heart, right? Mm -hmm. For it's with the heart that man believes. Yes. And like all computers which receive information through input devices, mm -hmm. whether it's a keyboard or a mouse or a camera or a microphone, whatever it is, right? We who have been fearfully and wonderfully made, like it says in Psalm 139, yes have been supplied with input devices to get information in. Our senses. Our senses. Yes. All right? Our senses are the input devices to the mind, mm -hmm. which stores the information in the heart. Because okay. that's what God searches. Yes. The senses feed data to the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. But those senses have to be trained. Yes. yes. Okay? It's not like, now, you know, we... Everybody that's been born has been given five senses, mm -hmm. okay? And all the world has that, and that's what they call common sense. We have something better than common sense. We have the ability to sense the presence of the Lord mm -hmm. and to use our senses. Our senses are our ears, our eyes, our mouth, our nose, our touch, mm -hmm. right? All of those things put information, put data into our brain. But we're supposed to use them in a way that reveals Christ to us more and more. Mm -hmm. So that we become like him more and more, right? 
And on those input devices, there are warnings. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you see. Yeah, right? that's the whole thing. That, that's why we're talking about putting on the helmet of salvation. That's to protect the brain, right? It says in Hebrews 5.14, the solid food of the word is for the mature, who because of practice has his senses trained to discern between good and evil. So your senses have to be trained. Okay? Before you were saved, you weren't using your eyes to fix them on Jesus Christ. You know, you were using your, your sense of touch, not, not to touch the things of God. Oh, you know, taste and see that the Lord is good. The world is polluted. I think you talk about the sense of smell. It says it, it not, pollution did not start with the Industrial Revolution. It says in Isaiah 24 that the whole earth was polluted by the transgressions of men. Because sin is a stench in the nostrils of God, right? And we have the mind of Christ. All right. So, interestingly and logically, and by the way, don't be afraid of the word logical, because the only thing that's logical is the word of God. Yes. Other people talk about logic. You know, Isaiah got it right when he said the whole head is sick. And Jeremiah, in, in chapter 10, when he says that all mankind is stupid, they can't do logic. Logic is what we have, because we can put things together spiritually. So, Satan, the father of lies, has the same goal as we do. You say, what? Mm -hmm. He wants to transform you. Mm -hmm. He wants to change you. God wants to transform you. God wants to change you. Satan wants to transform you, and Satan wants to change you. God has a plan for your life, Satan has a plan yeah. for your life. Two different dark directions. And he does it by working on your mind. God transforms us by working on our mind. Satan wants to, wants to change your mind, put in the other direction, right? He doesn't want to renew your mind. He wants to corrupt it and bring it back to the old ways of thinking. He wants to bring it back to the, the, the ways of thinking that lead to thinking that you, not Jesus, is Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and in control, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Leaning on our own understanding. And by the way, if you think that you're Lord, you know, you're not. Yeah. He's still Lord. That's right. But Satan has been allowed to lead your life, okay? Satan wants to bring you back to the deeds of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. Right? It talks about the difference between the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is obviously what's mourned by God's work in our life. Yes. Satan wants to change the way you think. He wants to change your mind so he can transform you back to the old corrupt man that you were. Right? Jesus wants to change our mind because he comes to bring life and life of another. Satan wants to change your mind because he comes to kill steal and destroy. They both want the same thing. Or they want to do the same thing. They want to change your mind to take you in different directions. It is indeed a battle for the hearts and minds. Okay? They both have a plan. Because, like I said, you get to the heart through the mind. You get to the heart through the mind. Have you ever heard of propaganda? I just, this thought just came to mind. This scripture is what it, that God says, I have plans for your good. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the plans that God has. But Satan's plans are... He, he, he wants to destroy you. Yes. And, and it also says that um, God thwarts Satan's plans. Yes. 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 He, says to, he says to the devil, he says, he says, devise a plan, but I will thwart it. Satan can't come up with anything that God is not... I mean, he's been defeated, all right? So propaganda is... The spreading of information to change people's thinking. And generally, we use the word propaganda for that changing people's thinking for harmful purposes, right? right? It's not a good connotation. No, it's not a good connotation. So remember what I just read from the letters of the Romans, mm -hmm. that we are to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Mm -hmm. We are, just as Jesus said, the light of the world and are to shine in the midst of darkness. I just I want to talk about something. I just want you to think about what I'm saying. Okay. 
I'm going to talk about divorce for a second. Okay? Divorce in my lifetime when I was young was a matter of shame and was avoided if it was at all possible. It's now so casual and commonplace that it's not unusual for people to enter into marriage first planning for the eventuality of divorce. Prenuptial agreements. Okay? And unfortunately, I believe the statistics are that divorce is as common in the church as outside the church. The use of foul language. Oh my goodness gracious, you can't go anywhere. You can't turn on the television or the radio without hearing foul, unwholesome language. God says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your lips. So that, that has gone from hidden and forbidden to commonplace. It floods our society. It's in the marketplace. It's in the workplace. It's on the radio, on the television, on all the airways. That's happened all in one generation. Acceptable. That's happened in one generation, yes. just like divorce. Yes. The acceptance of divorce has changed totally in one, one generation. generation. It's hard to believe. Homosexuality. Mm -hmm. I just this. I got to tell you, in, in my lifetime, it has gone from being prohibited mm -hmm. to being permitted mm -hmm. to being protected to now it is promoted right. and preferred in one generation. Okay. Society in America, the United Kingdom, in Europe, they all consider it sinful to call homosexuality a sin in one generation. Here's a word you don't hear anymore, fornication. Fornication. I mean, this is, you know, unmarried people having sexual relations, people living together and engaging in sexual activity. It went from a cause of shame to normality. It's absolutely, it's absolutely normal and totally accepted. No shame. It's the norm not to do it now. In or one it's generation, it's one abnormal generation. not to do it now. People are shocked. Yeah. Now I'm not going to talk. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking right now about the morality of things. Okay, because I want to make sure, like tattoos. Mm. I'm going to tell you when I was a young man, and I, I told you I was, I was. I flew in the U.S. Navy back in the early 60s and into the mid-60s. So tattoos, I promise you, back in that day was a realm of drunken sailors right. and biker gangs. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's who got tattoos, right? Now, it's, it's common among men and women of all ages and classes defacing, defacing their skin. To Christians, putting graffiti on the temple of God. That's what it is, in one generation. And, and more, I mean, there's so much more, right? If you stop and think about this, it's mind-boggling yes. that so much could have changed so rapidly. But it's also logical when you recognize the fact that in that same generation, the ability to distribute information exploded That's right. That's right. with movies and television and radio, right? And the internet. Satan has been able to blast his information all over. I wanted to read you something. I brought some notes from a study that I did. Gosh, this is, oh, this is back like 30 years ago. 30 years ago, right? I'm going to read something from the Humanist magazine. And this was written in 1983. So I, I walked into a, a public library because I was doing a study on the book of Revelation for the church that I was pastoring. And I just, I happened to see this and I picked it up. I'm, I'm going to read you from an article in the Humanist Magazine. I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith, a religion of humanity, that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, for they will be ministers of another sort, utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach. 
regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare, or large state university, the classrooms must and will become an area of conflict between the old and the new, the rotting corpse of Christianity, together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism, resplendent in its promise of a world in which the never-realized Christian idea of love thy neighbor will finally be achieved. Then, perhaps, we will be able to say with Tom Paine that the world is my country, all mankind are my brethren, and to do good is my religion. It will undoubtedly be a long, arduous, painful struggle, replete with much sorrow and many tears, but humanism will emerge triumphant. It must be if the family of humankind is to survive. That was an article by a guy named John Dunphy in the Humanist Magazine in 1983. He didn't make a secret of it. They've never made a secret of it. And this is one of the reasons I tell you, and if you're a parent of a child, I want you to know that there is, there is a hidden agenda in the public government educational system. And that hidden agenda is to destroy traditional Christianity. It is. Why do you think things have changed? Because the enemy had a plan. And the church sat back oblivious to the devil's plan. I'm telling you the truth. And you better, you better uh, sound the alarm. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Awake, awake, O Israel. I'm telling you, we better wake up. They, they, they might, the church might not have been oblivious to the plan. Oh, they were, Mark. But they knew it and just didn't care. Well, that's even worse. Yeah. I'm not, I, I don't want to get totally off the subject because that's a, I'm passionate about that subject. But the, the reason that things have changed in one generation is because of that. Because we have sent children into schools to be trained in the ways of the world which Jeremiah, God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah in the 10th chapter and said, absolutely do not do that. And yet, go back to the highest command in Deuteronomy, and God says that we're supposed to, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. We're supposed to abide in his word, and we're supposed to train up our children in the way they should go. Fathers are supposed to teach the word to their children in the house, out of the house, when they're up, when they're down. That's not happening. That's how the world has changed so completely and drastically in one generation. I promise you, we are close to the end. I was amazed that in that article that you just read, the guy's goal was to love thy neighbor. How can you love your neighbor with, they they don't know what it is. without be loving because, God? It's not because of it. Yeah. It is because Satan is a father by, by nature, a liar by nature, and the father of lies. That's yeah. why it is. Yeah. He, he, can, he, can, he can just lie, lie. You know, he's had a lot more practice at lying mm. than you've had at discerning the truth. That's why you've got to abide in the Word, not lean on your own understanding, and trust in God to reveal the truth to you. He has sent the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. I, I'm going to tell you this. NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, your favorite channels, they are all instruments of propaganda. Adolf Hitler... And Joseph Goebbels, his minister of propaganda, they had nothing on MTV and reality television. I'm telling you the truth. We have changed because we have been in, in just overwhelmed by propaganda and have not had on the helmet of salvation. The helmet is there to protect your brain box. That's what it's all about. An unprotected brain is going to be damaged this way. It's there to protect your mind, all right? That's why it says in Jeremiah 17, verse 5, okay? Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes man flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. You can't trust. You're not supposed to. I've said so many times here in this Bible say, don't trust me, test me, check it out. What did you say a few weeks ago? I don't know. About uh, the Word of God protects you from being stupid? Oh, yes. I said, I study the Word of God to to stop being stupid because I, uh, on my own, I'm a pretty stupid guy. Because it says all mankind is stupid. All mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. 
Okay. As the word goes in, the stupid goes out. Mm -hmm. So you, this is God. This is God saying you can't trust man. No. Absolutely. But rather, you must examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. That's what it says in First Thessalonians five twenty one. You've got to test everything. There is one and only one, and yes, this includes yourself here. Okay, who is faithful and who you can trust. I was reading from Jeremiah 17. Let me continue. Verse 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease to yield its fruit. Right. So let me go back to the verse that I mentioned when we started. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding. Okay? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 3 5. That's because even now, in our new saved condition, this is true, still true. <clears throat> Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the renewed and transformed mind is being conditioned to think his thoughts and fill our minds with his word. Get over yourself. You are not trustworthy. That's why, listen, but there's a plan. Paul, Paul got this. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul said, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We are being brainwashed. Hallelujah. You're being brainwashed one way or the other. <laughs> no, you're being brain dirty. dirty. You're brain okay. dirty. See, you can't be this, is, this is why water. Satan wants to control our language so we can't communicate. The fact of the matter is, brainwash means to have your brain right. cleansed. Right. Yeah. Satan can't do that. The enemies of God can't do that. Only God can do that. What he wants to do is put filth in your brain, all right? Remember, the devil can only brain dirty. Or brain pollute. Or pollute your brain. No. I'm going to end on this. We had a dear brother now going on to be with the Lord over in North Wales, Arthur Burke. Loved Arthur. And he used to say, what a man believes rules him. That is so true. I want to say that what fills your mind will fill your heart. What fills your heart will fill your mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what fills your mouth, well, James says it better than I possibly can. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Put on the helmet of salvation so you can bridle your tongue. God bless you till you meet again next time. And be back here and join us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. I will play.